uh, after having this accident in uh, 1986, this fire or this uh, car accident, and knowing that I had gone up and come back, and that it felt familiar, and I'm going, when would this have possibly have happened before? And then it hit me, the crosswalk, and then I saw the whole incident completely differently. I saw me walk off, get hit by the car, and I was on the front of the hood, and I could feel I couldn't breathe. I mean, it, my you know oxygen was knocked out of me when it got hit, and. I'm lying on the, the line, basically, on the front of the car, and it finally stops at the next intersection. And when it stops, the momentum knocks me off the, onto the cave, on the pavement, and I die, and I have the exact same thing happen to me, floating up in the air like that. Welcome in. I'm so excited about the guest we have today. Not only has he had one NDE, but he signed up for a twofer. <laughs> so we're going to be hearing both his stories today. I'm really interested to ask him a lot of questions about his experiences. But before we get started, make sure you click that notification bell and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of my upcoming videos. And if you're interested in what's going on on the planet, but you feel overwhelmed, you might want to sign up for my Friday morning email newsletter. The link is in the description box down below. Every Friday morning, we send out a very short, very sweet, but informative email newsletter containing all the things that we think were important that happened on the planet in the last week. It's very fun. It's very free. It's very informative. I think you're going to love it. Super easy to sign up. The link is in the description box down below. In today's toxic world, taking care of our health is more important than ever. One of the natural solutions I've integrated into my routine is the benefit of mushrooms. And the go-to place for me is Birch Boys. They are without a doubt one of the greatest resources for mushroom products on the planet. Made in the USA, sustainably sourced, and run by an absolute wonderful entrepreneur, Birch Voice has become my go-to for natural health solutions. While they have a wide variety of mushroom products, the two that I use every day are right here. First, I use the Chaga Now, which is a wonderful mixture that I put a tiny little scoop in my morning coffee to support my immune system. Chaga is one of the most effective immune support compounds on the planet, and this is a super way to get it into your daily diet in an easy to use formula and very, very effective for immune system support. And if you're looking for clear thinking, <laughs> I can tell you, you'll be surprised at the effects of lion's mane. I use this lion's mane tincture one teaspoon every single morning, and the difference in the clarity of my thinking is extraordinary. I was actually really, really surprised. Birch Boys has a whole lineup of mushroom tinctures. Make sure you check them out when you're on the website, but I'll tell you what, these are my two favorite and I use them every single day. They are absolutely a quality company built on integrity. Go to birchboys.com and use the code NEWEARTH for 20% off your entire order. Birch Boys mushroom products, I think you're going to love it. As I said, we have a guest today that has not only had one NDE, but two NDEs. I called him a tuber. His name is Greg Thompson. Welcome in, Greg. How are you today? Fine. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm so happy to have you here as well. I'm fascinated by your story mm -hmm. because, you know, I believe that we all sign up for what we're going to do before we come in, kind of a little outline of our life. And I'm wondering, did you sign up for two NDEs or did your guides just decide that that was something that needed to happen? Well, <laughs> what a, do you that, think? That's a good question. Uh, the first real NDE uh, was... Uh, not on purpose. <laughs> Not on purpose. Actually, I'm actually kind of ashamed. Uh, I had been drinking and drove. And okay. So that, kind of kind of get us, fill us in on what you were doing and then what happened the night of the first ND, just so we can kind of put it in perspective. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I was living in Seattle at the time and I was a software engineer uh, with many people reporting to me. And I had a uh, responsibility of uh, going to uh, share conferences, which is a, a technical conference. And I was behind, not able to uh, 
get time to actually write up what I needed to write up for that report. And so uh, I got promoted and into this new position that had only been in it for like maybe two months. And I felt a pressure on me. And my one of my colleagues became uh, got my old job. And he was wanting to uh, uh, celebrate the fact that he had gotten this promotion because uh, it was it was a pay, pay raise, too. And so he wanted to go to the local bar. And I was not much into bars and drinking, especially this one, because it, they push drinks, really push them bad. And so uh, but so I, I said, no, I'm not going to be able to make it. I'm going to go home and do some work. And uh, he kind of progressively said, well, I'm going to save a table, save a spot for you. I said, OK, fine. So I uh, drove on home and I've been home for about a half hour. And I was starting to work on the paperwork I needed to do. And I got a call from one of my colleagues saying, he's waiting for you. You got to get down here. I said, no, no, I already explained that I couldn't make it and such. And he said, no, 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 you're the team lead now. It's your responsibility to, to show team from work here that you're okay with him. And I'm going, oh, God, no, no. He said, you really, you need to be here. So I said, okay, fine. So I went out and got in the car and I started to drive away. My spirit guides got involved. Yeah, right off the bat. They, if they think I'm in mortal danger, they show up and they, they put their paws. I don't know. They put some pressure on my shoulders. And, and, and could, could you physically feel it? Physically feel the change and being pushed down a little bit. And they're warm. They're warm hands. And it's, it's basically, you know, danger, danger kind of thing. And I thought, oh, God, well, I, I you know, I'm just going to have one drink and I'm going to get out of there. OK, so I got there. I went in <laughs> and, yep, they were pushing drinks. There was probably about 20, 25 people there. And the, the guy was buying drinks for everybody, a round table, anybody. So anytime any one person got a, a refill, everybody got a refill. So by the time I got there, which is only like an hour and a half, two hours after the party started, there were five drinks on the table for me. And I'm just going, oh, this, I mean, I knew how to gauge myself if I had one drink and I, you know, and asked for a second one. I knew how to gauge myself with five. And it, they were always five. They were always five. When I left that night, when they closed, <laughs> there were still five drinks out there. No matter how you drank, there were still five. <laughs> there were still five. Yeah. It's like, okay. So I, I got up and I walked out and I go, whoa. And I had to drive home. Okay. And I thought about, well, I'll, I'll take a taxi or, or something like like that and I'll, I'll just park the car in the in the in our garage at the work and i pulled into the garage and it dawned on me oh wait a minute all this all the seating all the parking spaces have uh are signed so if i am not there at six o'clock in the morning to move my car out of there somehow you know somebody's going to be upset about that so i thought okay i'm going to have to drive home on my own <laughs> no, that was real smart thinking. So I got on the freeway. I drove down on the bio to, to take the turn off to, to head home. And as I was turning the corner, going down, it's just, a, it's just you just kind of curve around and get onto another, onto the highway, which is only like 10 minutes away from home. And I'm going around the corner. And the next thing I know, I'm not on the road anymore. I'm going bumpity, bumpity, bump down the hillside. And I come out and come across. And I, I realize when I'm coming back up, I'm coming up onto the highway. The highway that's going uh, eastbound, and uh, and there was nobody there. It, this was like, of course, two o'clock in the morning or something like that. And so I, I started going across that road, and I said, "Oh no, I got to stop! I got to stop!" And so I tried stopping, and somehow I turned the car engine, I turned the car a little bit, and it rolled over and over and over and over, and landed in the west lanes going back into town. When it landed, I <laughs> thought, "What the heck? Uh, I was I was knocked out." My head went through the sunroof, the glass sunroof. And uh, my, when I came to, the radio was still on, the lights were on, the car was not moving, and the engine was running. And I thought, what the heck, you know, where am I? What's going on? And um, it took a little while for my vision to come true and clear. All the windows in the car were broken, every single one of them. There was no windows. The glass was gone. I tried to get out of the car. And I finally was able to push myself out of the door because the door didn't want to open. When I got out, and then I saw what happened. The vehicle was completely totaled. I mean, just completely totaled. There was no spot on the car that looked like original. You know, it had rolled. And uh, and so you were you were able to get out of the car. And... I was able to get out of the car. I had to push real hard to get out. 
But your body, I mean, I can't imagine that you weren't injured. Well, there was a bump on the head <laughs> where, that, where I went through the sunroof. Uh, and I thought that was that was it. And of course, the cops showed up and they, you know, they did their thing. And, but then I got home and I, that, I, I, had, I took Friday off. I, that's happened on a Thursday night. I took Friday off and I canceled my trip to Philadelphia to do the meeting I was going to do. And uh, then the next night when I went to bed, I, I was I was basically unuseless on on that Friday. I I just couldn't think straight at all. And so then I uh, the next night, that second night at home, I started thinking, well, what happened? What did really happen in that? What what really happened? Because I can remember being on the road, and next thing I know, I'm going bumpy 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 across the kingdom come, and the it started coming back and then it really got serious as i was going down around making the bend around which was very it was not a sharp turn or anything just it's like i took my hands off the wheel and i tried to commit suicide and, it, and of course then went down through the whole thing and i'm going man that is okay i have really hit a new low i really hit a new because I, I really didn't want to die but with the alcohol yeah the, the, the alcohol the word, i mm -hmm. just kind of the wrong way so i'm a private uh, i've never had it i've stopped drinking uh may 3rd 1987 this happened in 1986 but i said there's something else missing here there's something wrong there's something wrong still i don't i didn't get everything right and i started and i kind of fell asleep a little bit half awake half a lot half asleep and that's when i realized i left when the car finally stopped i left the body and i'm floating up and as i floated up Everything around me went dark, and above me there was a white light, way up high. You know, the, the infamous white light, right up there above me. And I, I remember thinking, "I don't deserve this. I was drinking and driving. I don't deserve this." So I was, oh. I was feeling really. Poor. Are you Catholic? No, I'm not religious. <laughs> you have the Catholic guilt. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, no, no. I, I uh, actually, I, I don't belong to any church at all. Okay. So are these memories like all of a sudden tumbling back yeah. to you? Like, it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. And then all this starts. Wow. So you're floating up. So you I'm see the white up, light. Toward the white light. And I'm feeling that tall. And I then become aware of, of two spirits floating around me. All right. And they're kind of one side and one side, this kind of a thing. And as they're floating around me, one of them looks at me and mouths, why are you here? Okay, so, I have no idea. Uh, no, I, I didn't know either. I didn't. Know, I didn't. I didn't understand what that meant at all. And we kept going up farther and further and further. And I became aware of a consciousness above me, a source, or whatever you want to call it. We God. What everybody has. Many people have different names. I I can think of it as source. And it was became aware of me, and was welcoming me. And then all of a sudden there was this consternation of some sort. And the word no, and I was thrown back into my body. So it was, it's kind of like fish out of water, you know, oh, too small, put them back kind of thing. Yeah, not your time. Here's a question for you, Greg. That energy that you feel on your shoulders when they're trying to discourage you from some behavior, did the, the spirits that were whirling around you, did, that, did they feel familiar? Did they feel like the same yeah. energy that does that? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. you're like, oh, I know you guys. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're spirit guides. I have yeah. one is usually mm -hmm. very funny and, and funny and the other one's very serious so <laughs> the good cop bad cop yeah right yeah exactly <laughs> right. so in those kind of cases they hit both sides because you know this is wrong yeah mm -hmm. so they knew what was going to happen yeah it's interesting because um you're going there's something more to it even after knowing that 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 sound that felt familiar and I'm going, well, it's a past life, something we remembered from a past life or something like that. I go, no, no, no. And it finally dawned on me. And then this one's the, really the hard one to, to figure out. I still have not figured it out, really. I actually had a near-death experience when I was only 10 years old also. And that one is a memory, but did not happen. Okay. I have, uh, yeah, it's hard to explain. I'll start I'll start from the beginning of that one. That one, I, I, I was uh, 10 years old. And I was going, to, uh, walking through Oregon City, going down to the grocery store my parents owned, uh, and then going from there down to the bus depot to go to uh, have piano lessons, right? And it was the beginning of the school year, September timeframe. And I had a brand new 
a, a leather imitation jacket on in the in the style of a World War II bombardier pilot. Right. Uh, my father was a World War II bombardier pilot, uh, and he passed away before I was born, so I never had a chance to get to know him too well. <laughs> but uh, I, I I could wear something that might be like my dad did, right? I, I, so I was feeling I was feeling good, and I got to the a crosswalk. I called it the crosswalk incident in Oregon City on Seventh Street. There is a spot where um, traffic would be coming down the hill, uh, coming into town at 35 miles an hour at the top of the hill. And it's, the hill's probably about eight or 10 blocks long. When you get down toward the end of two blocks be so before the crosswalk, it drops to 25 miles an hour. But cars have a tendency to just keep on going fast for another block or two. They're now in a public uh, market area, you know, a lot of businesses and stuff. So that's the reason for the, the lower speed. And I'm standing there at the crosswalk, ready to walk across the street. And uh, there's some, an elderly couple come up behind me, and, uh, an old a man with a cane, and he's, his wife is actually holding him up, I think, a little bit. And there's a couple other people show up, and a few show up on the other side. And there's a flashing yellow light there for the crosswalk, and there's white lines marking the crosswalk out. So it's very obvious this is a crosswalk. And cars zipping by, zipping by, zipping by. Finally, I saw a spot where I could go, and so I stepped off the curb, and something, I say something, picked me up from the back of my jacket and put me back on the curb as a red car shot by and just missed me. Oh, right? my gosh. And I had, I had my coat zipped up, so I felt the zipper on my throat. Right. Somebody picked me up, and I'm kind of going, the only thing I remember was the old man behind me. I looked behind me, and there was no there was other people, but they were all, they, they were too far away to have picked me up from behind. He was right behind me, but he's an old man. So I looked at him and said, Mr. Did you pick me up, put me on back on the curb? And he, he looked at me and said, and smiled, said, no, Sonny, you have really good reflexes. And he looked at his wife and they smiled and laughed. And I'm looking back at the curb and going, no, I don't think I picked myself up on the back. And I said, I turned and looked and said, are you sure? And he said, yes, Sonny, I am. I go, okay. And they could clear it off. And, they, and so finally we had a chance and we all went across the crosswalk. And went, so I started going down 7th Street on the other side of the street. Uh, and I get down to the next intersection. Now I'm kind of worried about walking across crosswalks at all. And I'm on a side street now. I mean, if anybody was going to go, they take that route. And I looked around and I looked over and cars are driving by. Okay. And I said, fine. And I look to the left and it looks okay. And I look one more time to the right. And then I see it. I see a red car parked in the middle of the intersection. And there is a boy lying on the pavement in front of him. And I'm looking at that going, and people are running out to look at this what had just happened. And I hear this woman yelling, no, 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 no. And I turn to look and there's a woman running toward me about a block away. And she has an apron on. She's evidently the mother of the kid. And she's yelling, screaming about it. And I turn around and look back and it's gone. Traffic's just traveling normal. And I and I felt a, a, a coldness on the back of my neck and spine that there was a death here. There was definitely a death here. And uh, so I, I went on down the street and went into the grocery store. My mother wasn't busy at the moment. So I asked her if she had known about a kid being killed up there by a car lately. And she said, no, she had never heard of one. She asked my stepfather. He didn't know. And so I, I kind of forgot about it. After having this accident in uh, 1986, this fire, or this uh, car accident, and knowing that I had gone up and come back and that it felt familiar. And I'm going, when would this have possibly have happened before? And then it hit me, the crosswalk. And then I saw the whole incident completely differently. I saw me walk off, get hit by the car. And I was on the front of the hood and I could feel, I couldn't breathe. I mean, it, my, you know, oxygen was knocked out of me when it got hit. And I'm lying on the, the line, basically on the front of the car. And it finally stops at the next intersection. And when it stops, the momentum knocks me off the, onto the cave on the pavement and I die and I have the exact same thing happen to me floating up in the air like that. Now looking back, do you feel like it was time a timeline issue? Like there was one timeline and another timeline and yeah. you're in the timeline now where you didn't get hit. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so that 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 really shook me up because you know now okay. I had one for sure, you know, had, mm -hmm. had to go to the hospital, all that routine. And then I had this other one that shows two scenarios. And all I can think of is that, uh, well, <laughs> uh, I can speculate that for forever. I felt that the, uh, the one at age 10 and the one that I had 
in 1986, which geez, I forgot how old I was at that point in time, but definitely a lot. You were lot younger. Older. You okay. were younger. Yeah, <laughs> in, in between those two, I started learning. I was in, I was, uh, in college, University of Oregon, uh, first year, and I uh, had an experience there uh, one night. It's not an NDE, but it's uh, sort of along the same line. I uh, My roommate was gone that night for whatever reason. And I was I went to bed kind of early. And I'd been lying in bed for just a little while. And suddenly I found myself elsewhere. Okay. I was on a cobblestone street. And there were two walls of houses on each side of the cobblestone street. And the street kind of went up a little bit. And there were people just walking around. And they were dressed differently than us. Okay. And I didn't know where I was or what's going on. And then all of a sudden an earthquake. It was just moving, being moved all around the place. And uh, I saw a family come out, a family of five, and they start, started to walk down the cobblestone street. Everybody's coming down past me for whatever reason. But the second floor of that building, the wall fell over and landed on top of them and killed them. And then a voice went by me saying, help them die. And I'm going, what, what, what? Help them die. I go, who? I mean, they're dead. There's no, nothing to do about that there. And it came by one more time, help them die. Okay, I said, okay, fine. I have to do something along that line. And what I used was what I knew from the night, from the, being 10 years old. And I had the, uh, the memory of dying because that, that's what I visualized. And I, I, I sent out, uh, by that point in time, I knew how to do it. Uh, I divorced myself of the surroundings that I was in, in and I concentrated on producing uh, unconditional love. And I just, I just started doing unconditional love and just sending and then spreading it out and sending it out further, just like energy waves, sending it out to everybody that was affected. And I did that for, I don't know how long, but quite a long time. And finally, uh, everything stopped, you know, and I kept on doing it for a little bit longer because you know, then people still were hurt. And uh, what I was telling them uh, was, uh, you're not alone, you are loved. There are those here to help you move on your journey. And I just kept repeating that over and over again and sending out this unconditional love. And uh, finally, uh, everything quieted down and I suddenly woke up in bed wow. in the dorm room and I had been sweating and I was crying. And I had to get up. I had to go take a shower. I was just kind of soaked like that. About 1967 is when that happened. And I, you know, Internet didn't exist, right? right? So it would take days to find out what happened. Sure enough, two days later in the local paper, there was an article on page six that said there had been an earthquake in Turkey. Oh, and wow. it had the time and stuff like that. And I looked it up. Uh, I you know, figured out our time zone versus their time zone stuff. And it's the same time zone, same time frame that it happened. And I'm going, oh, my God. So I have helped people die off and on my entire life. Yeah. You so when you help. say die, you're talking about transitioning. Yes. Like letting go and moving on. And that, that, that's that's quite an assignment. It is. It is. Uh, and I finally, uh, in after 2001, after 9-11, I asked not to be involved in that anymore. And you did. It, and it was evidently granted because I didn't get any more requests. Yeah. In 2018, I thought, you know, I really still don't understand why I was ever chosen to do that. Why, why, what, why did I get, and I know others who have been done the same thing. So it's not me alone. I talked to other people who have had the same experience of helping people die and I said, okay, fine. So what's, what's going on here? What makes, what makes me a candidate for that kind of thing? And I said, I want to know. So I'm willing to do one more helping people, a person die or people die, but I want to have it observe, observe so I know what's going on. And I was granted. And I was allowed to help one person, a, a man in Syria who was a, uh, a prisoner, and he was being interrogated, interrogated. We won't talk about how that was happening. It's just say it was physical pain. And uh, I saw him there and, and I was told, and that's when I realized it was my guardian angel telling me, help, help him die. And I said, okay, fine. So I went about doing it and the man had was very good. Uh, he obviously was a spy of some sort or an enemy to them. He knew how to protect himself and he had moved himself mentally into a position that they could do anything they wanted with the body. He didn't feel it. And so, and there were two spirits floating around above him 
around his head and chest trying to get his attention. And so I, I started doing the same thing with him. Uh, the same saying, you're not alone, you're loved. And uh, there are two, I, can say, there, I actually sent a picture mentally, uh, there are two <laughs> right there waiting to help you. And it took a while, but it finally, he finally moved a little bit, finally moved a little bit, finally moved. And I just kept saying the same things, mantra over and over again. And finally he saw them and that left and the body died. So I then I said, okay, now I know what happened and I saw how I did it and such. And it dawned on me, oh, yeah, I'm an empath. I can't kind of keep forgetting that. Okay, it just it's just me. And what I was being is, is I have the capability of going into somebody else and and communicating telepathically and sending unconditional love, that sort of thing. And and there's a lot of us that do that. There's a lot of us. Well, that do that. you know, that's a pretty specific job. Greg, you know, yeah. do you have any memories of signing up for that before you came in or agreed? <laughs> no, I know, I know, I don't, I don't. It's, it, it's, it really bugs me that I don't have experiences beyond waiting to come back. It's like that's when the veil went up, right? Right. And, and okay, and, when you were waiting to come back in, mm -hmm. yeah, what was your emotional state? Was it excitement? Was it like nervousness? Was it dread? Was it patience? It was patience. Yeah, okay. I I knew there was something happening that was that I thought was good, but I didn't know why I thought it was good. And what it was really weird. It's I can still visualize it. It was a a dark space, a black space, and all the souls, and there were thousands of us of there. Uh, well, at least hundreds, I can't say thousands, I didn't count. There was, um, each one of us was represented in a color, a different color, and the color was of our of our soul. And we looked kind of like comets in a way. We had kind of a rounded front on and then a tail. Mm -hmm. And there was red and yellows and blues and greens and purples and whites and, you know, all this sort of thing. And we were all traveling at slightly different speeds. <laughs> and I remember, the only thing I remember about it was that I was kind of slow at it. And there were some that were going a little bit faster and they were, I wouldn't say upset, but that's in the physical world, I suppose that's what it would sound like. They were upset that I was in their way. <laughs> I, I think about that's my first traffic jam, you know, was trying to, was trying to get through this stuff. And eventually what I've seen, again, I remember this from being three years old. This is a memory I had from three, when I was three years old of this life before coming back and, and, and also the womb and the whole thing. It's just like, uh, where would I go with this? Every once in a while, I would see a hand come down into this mix of, of flowing souls and pick one up and take it away. All right. Now, this is a three year old trying to remember something that happened before birth. All right. So I'm sure it's been misconstrued into a physical conception. Uh, and when it got out of sight, I would then hear a scream, and, and that was it. And then in the life we kept, we kept on, we just kept on moving. And finally, it was my turn to go, right? They took me away and I couldn't see them anymore. And I felt kind of anxious. Uh, and all of a sudden I was split in two. And part of me stayed and part of me came back and landed in the womb. Okay. Yeah. So I can't help but think that either my guardian angel or, or one of the spirit guides I have or something like that may be the other part of me observing me as a, in a physical world. That's a, a speculation. I have no proof one way or another. Right. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm so curious about all that stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> really, yeah. Like, what is this all about? Yeah. Okay. So you've had, you had the ND in the car. Yeah. And you remembered it later. Yeah. Why do you think that happened to you? Like, you know, you have this experience and it's like, I always wonder, okay, what's why, what's the message there? And is the message for Greg is the message for humanity? You know, what's the message? I think it was awakening. Uh, I mean, I already was spiritual. I mean, I had been since, well, like three years old. <laughs> uh, I've always had a, a, a connection with spirit world. I, but why why in 1986 did I have to, uh, I wouldn't say have to. I think it gave me more empathy. I mean, I'm talking about somebody who tried to commit suicide. Yeah. I was talking about somebody who drank too much. And it was a social drinker, by the way. I, I like I said, I, I, it only it took me about six months and I stopped drinking completely, and I haven't had a drink since. So I have empathy for people who are on drugs. It doesn't matter what the drug is, and knowing that how that can ruin one's mind, 
Critical thinking too. Critical thinking and, yeah. and self-preservation. Um, uh -huh. So that helps me a lot. So I see these things about these things happening in the, in the newspapers, you know, especially in Portland. Well, in Portland, I don't, where are you located? I can't. I'm in Florida. Oh, you're in Florida. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, Portland has a real problem right now. Uh, they're trying to resolve it. We are all trying to resolve it uh, with homelessness and drug addictions. I won't go any further than that. No need to. But I have an empathy for that. And actually, I have, uh, I'm the godfather for of a, a woman now who uh, is mentally ill. So uh, I think maybe all that stuff is helping me prepare for understanding more. Yeah. 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 And it wasn't my turn to come. <laughs> you couldn't stay. No, you've got to go back. No, what no. are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. So what happened with your final NDE? I mean, yeah. are, are you planning on having more or what? <laughs> I came close to a fourth one, but uh, oh my heavens! Uh, but no, the third one was uh, was the norovirus. Uh, I had uh, three surgeries on my right foot for a viral foot infection, and I had three surgeries in ten days, and I was sent off to rehab to learn how to walk again. And uh, in there, I got the norovirus. And nor I don't know if you're familiar with the norovirus. I had heard about it uh, before, but I had never been anybody knew anybody. It's like pneumonia. It's the kissing cousin of pneumonia. Oh, it is. Okay. Now, uh, I had a doctor come in and explain to me what it was, what I had when when they determined it. Uh, I was put in quarantine, and um, no one was allowed to come in except a nurse if she had to, or a technician if they had to, and they were wearing masks and all that routine. Um, but uh, yeah, he said uh, they're kissing cousins, and they the two of them together are the number one cause for death in of humans: norovirus and pneumonia. They're almost identical. It's just how they have how they came into the body and such. They are they attack the immune system. That's their purpose in life is to attack the immune system. And we all we're living with it every day. We where our bodies normally have a protection against it. But yeah, we, but because you had had those surgeries, you were. I was not doing well. Yeah. You were not at your best, most yeah. immune self. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I asked the, the doctor when he got done, he said, you have any questions? I said, yeah. I said, what are my, what are my chances? And he said, oh, uh, probably about 40%. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, wait, wait a minute, 40% chance of living or 40% chance of dying? And he said, uh, of dying. And I said, oh, well, that's still, you know, above 50%. So, you know, Okay. And then he started thinking about it a little bit. He said, well, actually, he says, I think I got that wrong. And he, he thought about it. So he said, well, you've, let's see, you've had, uh, you've had a viral, viral uh, foot infection, three surgeries. You, you've you got the norovirus. And so he said, uh, at, at that time, uh, it was also known that I had a heart problem. And he said, so he said, I give you probably about a 30% chance. I said, of survival? He said, yeah. You said leave before the number gets down to 20. <laughs> but then but then he said, he said, I'm going to tell you something I will, ne I will never tell anybody. I will, I'll deny that I ever said anything. I said, what's that? And he says, we don't know. And I said, okay. He said, it, we, we have learned and we don't have any science for it. But what we have seen is if the person wants to live, their chances are much higher than if they are just giving up. And he said, yeah. you have every reason in the world to be wanting to give up because of all the things that have happened to you over the last six months. He said, but if you have the right attitude, you'll be okay. I said, well, I don't want to die. He said, good, keep that thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, then the body slowly died. It took five days for the body to die. Uh, the first thing was I recognized that I had um, no feeling in my feet. Right? I kind of go, well, the right foot makes sense because it's the one that had the operation. I don't know why the left foot has a you know, problem. And then it moved into my legs, the lower legs, then the, the, then the whole leg. And then it started happening in my fingers, numbness, and then not being able to move them. The muscles stopped working. And then it was my arms and stuff. And then finally, on the end of the fifth day, uh, the sixth morning, it had gotten to the point where the body wouldn't move at all. Uh, I, could, I could blink my eyes and that was all. And when the nurse, the nurse comes in, uh, I think it was every two hours or every three or four hours, I can't recall. I think it was every, maybe every four hours. They'd come in and say, Mr. Thompson, how are you doing? And they would say it behind a closed curtain, all right? And just open the door and say it and then leave. 
And uh, I had to say anything, even if it was a grunt. And I thought, a grunt? Nah, no, I can talk. Well, that moment, <laughs> that morning, it was probably about one o'clock in the morning. All I could do was grunt. Now, were you lucid? I was lucid. So you were very aware, but your body was just going offline. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The, whole, the whole time. And so at that point in time, when I couldn't say anything, and she said, thank you, Mr. Thompson, and I left, <laughs> I'm lying there. And of course, when you're in quarantine, it, things are a little bit different. I mean, obviously, I'm not I'm not able to eat food, right? So I, I had um, food being fed intravenously. They didn't even bother coming in to turn on lights at night when it got dark out. And it, this is talking in the wintertime. So, you know, dark gets around 4.30, 5 o'clock kind of time frame. So it gets dark at that point in time. And then, you know, in the morning, it's the next time you see light. And I couldn't do anything. Like I said, the body just slowly dying. So there I am just lying there with not being able to do anything except blink my eyes. <laughs> and I uh, thought about, I am actually dying. That was my first thought that fine, I, 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 I'm actually dying. And I thought, well, how, how, how is it going to be affecting others? And so I thought about uh, co-workers because I was still working for IBM at the time. Most of my coworkers lived in, or worked in Poughkeepsie, New York. Right? And I'm here over in Portland. And so I thought, well, they're, they're, going to, they're going to do what I did before too, is when they had somebody ill or whatever, they pass a card around and you sign it, right? And maybe the manager will send some flowers or whatever. I had already told my manager uh, when it, my first diagnosis of norovirus, that, you know, I don't know how things are going to turn out. So he, his thoughts were fantastic. He said, don't worry about a dang thing at work. Your job is guaranteed to be here when you come back. Don't worry about it. Get well. That's where you need to do. Get well. A good man. And he was a good man. Yeah. yeah. So I thought about that and going, well, he's, he's pushing for me and stuff. But what about the others? And then I thought, well, yeah, they write the card and stuff. And because I only go out there like three year, three months a year, uh, three times a year. And so they don't get to see me that much. They don't know me. So they, you know, you know that person on, on the West Coast, okay. And so I figured, okay, they're, they're not going to be much. Well, what about really good friends? And at that time, I had four, I had three other friends. We good, we went to college together. We've been together all, all, all these years. We'd go out taking photographs. We'd take trips doing, taking photographs and stuff like that. We had fun. They would take it harder. They would take it harder, and they would show up probably at my at a memorial or whatever. Okay, and hopefully say good things about me. <laughs> All right, uh, and so that okay, that's good, that's good. And then I started thought, okay, what about loved ones? And I thought, oh, uh, Nancy's parents. Nancy is my significant other, and her parents are fantastic people. They were fantastic folks, uh, and uh, her father. His, I, my birthday was on his birthday. Oh, so there was a connection there too. And then he had two daughters and he always wanted to have a son. So I became the adopted son. So, uh, so he, he would take it hard, but he would, he'd be, he can be, he's very practical. Uh, he was a World War II vet and he knew he'd seen bad things before. So he was, he'd be okay with it. Nancy's mother, on the other hand, would, uh, she was the, she was the dominant person in the, fa in the family. And, uh, she would be a worry wart over nothing. And so if she saw me dead or to almost to the point, she would be worried about Nancy. She wouldn't be worried about anything else and see how Nancy take it. Nancy at that point in time did not believe in an afterlife. She had learned how to be a Catholic when she was very young, but, but kind of walked away from it at some point. We never talked about that. But she did not believe in near-death experiences. She did not believe in uh, a lot of this sort of thing that I do, that I've lived with my whole life. And she started coming around a little bit because of my insistence, or not insistence, my joy of when I was talking about good things happening uh, and the fact that a spirit guide had done this or whatever for me. Uh, she, she was starting to come around, but she hadn't gotten quite there yet. Uh, so I, my prayers were for her to be able to survive this okay. And then after that happened, there was nobody else to talk to about it. I, I, I was done. And my mind basically just became kind of almost, it, I became an observer outside my body looking at what was going on. And that's when the golden sphere of souls appeared. 
The Golden Sphere of Souls is something that I have seen three times now in my life. It is a ball, a golden ball, probably, well, I've seen it in multiple shapes, but usually it likes to be about four feet in diameter. And it's golden with white and silver flashing lights inside it, which are souls. And they're all working together as one to help whatever. And, and the previous times they'd come to me, I was heavily depressed many years before the uh, car accident. And uh, they came and they hugged me. They, they'd show up and they'd come in and, and I, I'd ask them to come forward, come forward, and they'd come forward because they wouldn't do it otherwise. And they came forward and they would just wrap me up in energy, nice, beautiful energy. And I would just go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'd just stay there for as long as needed. And finally, I started relaxing, feeling okay, then they could just kind of disappear. And here they were again at the bottom of my bed. And I'm kind of going, well, this is weird. Are they here to take me away? I didn't think they did that sort of thing. <laughs> I thought they just, you know, uh, would uh, be here to love me or whatever. Well, they, uh, that's what they did. They, I, I said, please come forward. All right. That was, that was the, that was what needed to be said in order to say, I want to live. Oh, okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. they, they started the process to do something and they came and they started putting energy into my feet first and my feet got warm and they moved up slowly up the body and they were going up legs and just slowly work ever so slowly, ever so slowly. Like they So were, they were healing you as they, they were, were going healing up. the body. Yeah. Wow. Okay. How did that feel? I mean, was it, did well, you just feel this overwhelming sense of love? Yeah, that's for sure. That was for sure. And I couldn't move my body yet, but I could I could feel the change. I could feel I could feel something in my body. Okay. Where before okay. when they died, there was there was just, you know, might as well a piece of wood, right? And so they slowly moved up, but they there was more surprises that happened. When it got up to my heart, I left the body and I, I was elsewhere. I was in the middle of the universe someplace. And it was just like, whoa, what, where, where am I? And there was no response, but I, could, I was aware that something was watching me and whatever. And I got to see planets colliding with each other. I got to see moons collapsing, comets, all this sort of thing. And what I got out of that was anything that's destructed is reused and becomes beautiful again. Okay. So, so energy never dies. It just changes form. It just changes form, changes matter. Mm -hmm. It's bizarre. And I thought, well, that's a beautiful thought. That's a beautiful thought. I'll have to keep that in mind. And uh, and then I was, I was told I could ask her a question. And so my question was, when and where was I created? And uh, immediately I found myself in a large white disc with thousands of other souls, all white. We're all, well, I assume I was white. I couldn't see, but I'd be the black sheep in the family. I don't know. But it was all white. And we, they were all excited because something good is about to happen. Really super good is about to happen. And I thought, okay, this is this is different. I, I don't know about this. And, and I, but I got caught up in it too. You know, it felt good. It, it was just everybody on the same page. Something really good is about to happen. All right. And so we're getting better and better, more energy, more energy, more energy, more energy. And then suddenly it blows up and we're thrown out into the universe. And we're flying through the universe. And, and I think that was the universe being created. Oh, okay. Because there was nothing out there in front of us. And oh. as we were going through it. And we were in joy, absolute pure joy, just flying through space. And find, and then slowly but surely, we start seeing some little pieces of rocks and whatever like that around. All right. But I felt like it had to be the, the uh, creation or maybe or something similar to it another maybe it's another sun that was being created but it was fantastic and slowly but surely i started feeling tired and i go i don't want to leave i don't want to leave i don't want to leave and i just slowly fell asleep or that's what it felt like the next thing i'm aware of is that i'm lying in bed i'm in the body and my eyes are shut but i feel like there is something it's light out i know it's light out and my first so my first thought is Am I in my room, in my body, or am I somewhere else in space? I didn't know where I was. And I thought, and I'm just lying there thinking about this. And then I became aware there was something dark on the right side of me someplace. And I thought, well, what could that possibly be? 
And then this voice out of nowhere, only I heard it, said, well, Greg, open up your goddamn eyes. <laughs> I'm going, oh, somebody has a sense of humor. So I opened up my eyes and I was in the bedroom or in my uh, room. And there was a priest standing next to me and he had his Bible open up and, and he's reading from it quietly. And I've become aware he's reading my last rites. Oh, I knew. Surprise. Here I am. <laughs> and he got done to the book and I'm looking at him and he goes, oh, hello. <laughs> and I said, hello. I'm going, I could say hello. I can talk. I said, you'll never believe what happened last night. And I started blabbing off everything I, I told him like that. And uh, and he went off to tell the nurse that he's alive. And um, after that, I had, first I had attendants, uh, nurses, doctors, technicians come into the room. And about the third group that came in to say hi, they said, we we had heard that you had died and came back to life. We had to see the man who came back to life. Okay, fine. Uh, so I did die, and I'm back. And then uh, Nancy showed up a, a couple hours later, and she came in, and she goes, and she goes running around the bed and comes up to me, and she she jumps up on top of me, and she says, oh, I'm so glad you're you're okay. And she kept on fabbing by talking, talking, talking. Now, she's hard of hearing, but I'm even in worse shape because I've been dead, right? So... <laughs> I can't breathe with her lying on top of me. I mean, she's not that heavy. And I'm going, I'm going I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And she, she goes, oh, 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 I'm sorry. And she goes aside and she says, well, how are you feeling? And I said, well, I'm better than I was. And she said, yeah, I, I heard about it. And uh, I said, yeah. And uh, I said, uh, she said, yeah. And she said, you're so gray. And I said, there had been several people, friends that had come in before before she arrived. And when they got past the curtain that had been laid up there, uh, they would stop and just stare. And they always said the same thing. You're so gray. You're so gray. I said, well, everybody keeps telling me that. She says, you haven't seen yourself? I said, and where do you find a mirror in this place? <laughs> she said, oh, so she asked the nurse, do you have a pocket mirror or something like that that he can see himself? And she said, yes, I will. So she brought it back and showed it to me. My skin was gray. Wow. And my lips were blue. Oh, I mean, gosh. I truly was dead. Yeah. And going, wow. All right. So that, that's my last NDE. And, gosh. Uh, so how was your recovery? Was it pretty quick or did it take a long time? Uh, from that one, um, it took me probably about two weeks to get to. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't All right. Long. Yeah. So here's the question I have. Mm -hmm. you clearly first of all have a hard time staying in your body <laughs> <laughs> it, there's more to that yes and i would imagine i've only heard a small fraction mm -hmm. of the things that have happened throughout your life i imagine it's a slippery slope you stay in yeah. some yeah. people just pop out a lot you know and clearly <laughs> you're one of them yeah yeah i um uh, i find this world to be interesting i, I look out, I, I live in a forest all right. They do. And mm -hmm. so I, I got a lot of evergreen trees. They, they seem to have survived most of the storms we had. But when I started looking at them years ago, when I, when I moved into this house, the patio looks out on the on the forest behind, behind the house. And I found myself looking at the trees and I'd look at the needles on the, or leaves on the tree and I'd work my way down the limb and to the bark on the tree itself. And I'd start imagining first of all it's imagination look at it to see what's it look like if i were looking inside the bark and all of a sudden i'm drawn inside the tree okay and then i'm inside the tree i can feel the moisture going up and down inside like that and if i stay with it long enough i could calm myself long enough because <laughs> the first time i did it Whoa! oh it's gone <laughs> uh, but once i finally got to the point where i can calm myself down to the point of, of being basically at their time level mm -hmm. and they 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 are very slow and meticulous, and they are aware of the other trees around them. They're aware of the surroundings like that. They will actually try to help another tree if it's sick. They will send the appropriate kind of med medications they can, either by blowing it through their limbs or through the root systems, which may be intertwined. All right. It's, it's a wonderful, it's a whole other world here that we have. Yeah, it is. And I would imagine the energy of the tree is really interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah it is. It's mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's slow, but it's very 
strong. Very yes, strong. very yeah. substantial. Yeah. Yeah. So why do you think, why you, do you think you signed up for this, particularly the helping souls transition? I think I did. Yeah. I had a really good friend pass away in 2022. I was one of the four people I knew from college days. And he was homeless when COVID hit. And he was living in his car. And I didn't like the idea of him, especially when they closed the restaurants and stuff like he used to go to the restaurants and stay there until they closed at one o'clock in the morning, whatever, you know, get warm, have a cup of coffee or whatever. And I said, no, no. So I invited him to stay in my house. And I have an extra bedroom in the back of the uh, back here. And so, uh, so he moved in there. Uh, then he got uh, prostate cancer and uh, was treated for that. And he did not go in for one of his monthly checkups. And the body took advantage, the cancer took advantage of that and it became bone cancer the following month when he went in. And it took him uh, over a year to die. And I feel that that was, he became very spiritual extremely yeah. spiritual and he wanted to know about my experiences we had long conversations about spirit guides and you know god and all that and i feel that's one of the things i'm here for is yeah. to help people understand that it, it, it's not the end when you die it's no. just the beginning it's just the beginning it's yeah. it's just the beginning and, or it's just the continuation yeah of, yeah. of an eternal existence yeah. and this is as much as I moan and whinge about some things going on on this planet, this apparently is a tiny blip <laughs> of time. <laughs> Seems yeah. like it's lasting forever. Yeah. Gosh, this is, I am just fascinated by you. I can only imagine the other experiences that we're not going to be able to get to today. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I would, I would imagine that someone I mean, someone who pops out of their body so easily, you've probably done it quite a bit. <laughs> Um, or or had unusual are you able to do it on like can you lay down and just decide i'm gonna go somewhere or go check something out or that sort of thing it's getting harder to, yes the answer is yes but, but it's uh -huh. getting harder to do is it? it yeah it's kind of like is my ego getting in the way or what because you, you have to basically be you have to be completely calm yeah and to get the body completely calm sometimes can be very difficult to do. And I've had, uh, well, let's see, uh, there was a time we, that, with the norovirus, I had to learn how to walk again. Last year, January of last year, I fell and slipped on some ice and I sent to the hospital and I have now a metal rod in my right uh, leg because of a, a, a fractured hip. And I had to learn how to walk again, all right? So I'm still getting lessons learned from the physical world. And it, it so it has become a kind of a situation that sometimes I have no problem. There are days, there are mornings when I wake up in the morning and I don't know where I'm at. I have no idea. And I kind of go, it looks familiar, but why does it look familiar? And then it oh, goes, right. This is Earth. This is Earth. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I, I'm born somewhere, right? Yeah, <laughs> you have. Yeah. Probably further than the rest. Of, I mean, I think we all travel at night, but you may I, go further than the rest of us. I think a lot of us do, and we don't know it. Uh, oh, yeah. I yeah. do, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. It has been such a charming delight to talk with you and to hear your story. Do you have a website or anything that you want to share with us? Or uh, you know what? And I actually have a book. You have a book. Tell us about that, and I'll make sure and list it in the description box down below. Yeah, it's called Living with My Spirit Guides. Oh, Very okay. simple. Enough, yeah. Good cop, bad cop. That would be an alternative title right there. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Yeah. And I have a uh, website by the same name, except it is, it, there's no spaces and it's just living with my spirit guides .com. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. But yeah, the book's out and it's available in hardback, paperback, uh, audio, and uh, ebook. And what year did that come out? Uh, 2021, I think. Oh, wonderful. Okay, yeah. great. Well, we'll have all that listed down below in your website as well. Okay. So people can find out more about you and learn more about your experiences. Clearly, you've been here before. You know, okay, I got past <laughs> memories too. That's, why. <laughs> so, that's a whole other chapter. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like the veil is really thin for you. Yeah, yeah. 
I uh, I kind of find myself thinking that this might be the last time I'm going to be on Earth. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've learned a lot. I, I feel like this was coming back one more time, kind of a thought. Yeah. And it sounds like it was coming back one more time to maybe just finish off just a just the icing on a few lessons, but then to be of service as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm also the group leader for Portland, Oregon Ions. I don't know if you're Oh, you are. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I've got that going for me too. That's such a great group. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of fun. We do a lot of sharing groups. Yeah. It's, it's what's what's really fun is when somebody has come in for the first time and they're they're shy. They don't know if they really want to talk. They don't they don't know if they really trust everybody's going to be okay and stuff like that. And so I say, fine, no, just listen. You know, just listen. And so about halfway through a, a two and a half hour conversation. We've had several people talk about their experiences and stuff like they had made dear death, or it might be just a spiritual transformative experience of some sort. And all of a sudden, she's kind of going, or he, and and I said, do you, do you want to say something? She said, well, uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit, maybe just a little bit. I said, okay, fine. So she says something, and we all nod, and we all agree, and we ask her a question or two like that. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, she's telling her story. <laughs> <laughs> because she's told her family and they've all said that she's crazy. Yes, right. Exactly. <laughs> and finally she gets to meet a people that go, we know exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's a wonderful organization. Yeah. It really a, is. I love I love it. Well, Greg, thank you so much for your time. It's just been delightful. Sure, sure. Anytime. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> and thank you everyone for joining us. Bye now. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed this video. Coming up next. This is a good one, or you might really like this one too. Either one of them could be perfect for you. Before you leave, don't forget to subscribe.